Good morning. Welcome to the United. Uh, you're very helpful, Judge Breyer. That's it. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the United States Sentencing Commission's public hearing on synthetic cathinones. The commission appreciates the attendance of those joining us here as well as those watching our live stream broadcast on the commission's website. As always, we appreciate the significant public interest in the work of the commission, particularly this year as we tackle the important and emerging issue of synthetic drugs. I would like to start by introducing the other members of the commission. Uh, first, to my left, is uh, Commissioner Rachel Barco. Commissioner Barco is the Siegel Family Professor of Regulatory Law and Policy at the NYU School of Law and serves as the Faculty Director of the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law at the Law School. My right is Judge Charles Breyer. Judge Breyer is a senior district judge for the Northern District of California and has served as a United States district judge since 1998. To the left of Commissioner Barco is uh, Judge Danny Reeves, who was appointed to the commission this year. Judge Reeves is a district court judge for the Eastern District of Kentucky and has served in that position since 2001. And to his left uh, is Commissioner Patricia Wilson-Smoot, uh, the designated ex officio member of the commission representing the United States Parole Commission. <laughs> Commissioner Smoot has served on the Parole Commission since 2010 and was designated as chair in 2015. Finally, uh, to my far right is uh, Zachary Baletho, who's the ex officio commissioner from the Department of Justice Commissioner Balatho serves as counsel to the Deputy Attorney General of the United States. Before we begin our hearing, I would like to update you briefly, briefly on some of the Commission's most recent work. Since our last public meeting on August 17th, the Commission has released two publications that I think many will find interesting on September 5th. The Commission issued a report analyzing the almost 1,700 sentence commutations under President Obama's 2014 clemency initiative. It provides data concerning the offenders who received a sentence a commutation under the initiative and the offenses for which they were incarcerated. It also provides an analysis of the extent to which they appear to have met the announced criteria for the initiative. Finally, it compares the number of offenders incarcerated at the time the initiative was announced with the number of offenders who actually received a sentence commutation. On September 28th, the Commission issued a report that discusses the many legal and social science issues relating to the alternative to incarceration court programs that have emerged in many federal district courts around the country. As part of its consideration of alternatives to incarceration, the Commission for some time has been studying specialized court programs for certain types of offenders, most commonly for those with substance abuse disorders. Out of necessity, the Commission's study has been qualitative rather than quantitative because at this juncture there is a lack of robust empirical data available about them. The Commission did, however, send staff to visit five districts with established programs to interview program judges and staff and to observe proceedings. On April 18th, the Commission conducted a public hearing and received testimony from experts on state drug courts and other problem-solving courts, as well as from, a, from federal district judges who have presided over three of the more established alternative to incarceration programs. Many questions about these programs cannot be answered at this point. Not only are they relatively new in the federal system and have graduated only a small number of participants to date, they also have developed in a, decent, a decentralized manner and differ from each other in significant respects. Thus, they cannot yet be evaluated empirically to determine whether the programs meet their articulated goals as or more effectively than traditional federal sentencing and supervision options. 
and the report the commission recommends that existing programs and any new, newly developed programs include input from social scientists so that data may be properly collected to allow for a meaningful evaluation in the future. Look for the commission's upcoming publication, Mandatory Minimum Penalties for Drug Offenders and the Federal Criminal Justice System, and an update of the analysis of demographic differences in sentencing that the commission performed for its 2012 Booker Report within the next few months. With regard to training, on September 6th through 8th, approximately 500 judges, probation officers, defense attorneys, and prosecutors attended the Commission's National Training Seminar in Denver, Colorado. Next year's National Training Seminar will be held on May 30th through June 1st, 2018 in San Antonio, Texas. We hope to see many of you there. Finally, I'd like to remind the public th that the Commission is currently accepting public comment regarding seven proposed amendments to the guidelines. Among the proposed amendments are proposals to provide adjustments in the guidelines for certain first-time offenders, as well as further consideration of the availability of alternatives to incarceration for certain federal offenders. Amendments that would respond to legislation, including implementation of the Bipartisan Budget Act, which relates to fraudulent claims under Social Security programs, and an amendment that would address recommendations from the Commission's Tribal Issues Advisory Group regarding how tribal convictions are treated in Chapter 4 of the Guidelines Manual and the definition of court protection order in the manual. These are important issues, so I would urge the public to provide comment to the Commission by October 10th, which is the close of the original public comment period. The Federal Register Notice and instructions on how to provide public comment can be found on the Commission's website. The Commission is also currently seeking public comment on an issue for comment pertaining to THC, synthetic cannabinoids, and synthetic cathinones, the latter of which is the subject of today's hearing. The public comment period ends on October 27, 2017, and again, we look forward to receiving and reviewing the public comment as we grapple with this complicated issue. This is our second public hearing on the general issue of synthetic drugs. We held a public hearing on synthetic drugs on April 18th, which was within weeks of the Commission regaining its quorum. And the Commission is already planning a third public hearing for December that will focus on synthetic cannabinoids and fentanyl. The issues raised by emerging synthetic drugs are very complicated and novel in many respects, and it is essential for the Commission to provide clear and practical guidance to courts on how to properly and fairly account for them under the guidelines. For that reason, we look forward to hearing from our expert witnesses today. Today's public hearing will focus on synthetic cathinones. We will hear testimony from experts on the pharmacological effects of these drugs and their chemical structure, observations from the medical community, and the challenges these drugs pose to law enforcement. We look forward to a thoughtful and engaging discussion. Each witness has been allotted five minutes for their statements. Your time will begin when the light turns green. Yellow means there is one minute left, and red means your time has expired. Our first panel will examine the pharmacological effects of synthetic cathinones. The panelists are Dr. Cassandra Prelo, Dr. Michael Gatch, and Dr. Travis Wurst. Dr. Prelo is a drug science specialist for the Drug Enforcement Administration. Before joining the DEA, Dr. Prelo worked as a pharmacologist for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. She has also com completed fellowships in Paris and at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Dr. Prelo received her Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Connecticut in 1990. She received her PhD in Pharmacology from the University of North Carolina in 1998. Dr. Gatch is an Assistant Professor of Biomedical Sciences at the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth. He has been 
with the University of North Texas since 1996, serving as a research assistant professor until assuming his current title in 2013. Dr. Gatch focuses his research on preclinical models of drug abuse, in particular, the development of medications for the treatment of psychostimulant addiction. Dr. Gatch received his Bachelor of Arts in Behavioral Science from the University of Chicago and his Master of Arts in Behavioral Science from the University of Houston. Thereafter, he earned his PhD in Psychology from Utah State University. Dr. Wurst is an instructor of forensic science at Bowling Green State University, as well as an adjunct assistant professor for the University of Maryland University College. Before joining Bowling Green State, is it Bowling Green State or is it just now Bowling Green University? It's Bowling Green State, sir. All right, Bowling Green State. Dr. Wurst, Wurst worked as a forensic scientist for the Drug Identification Laboratory and the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Dr. Wurst received his Bachelor of Science degree with a major in pharmacy and minors in chemistry and biochemistry from Ohio Northern University in 1999. He received his PhD in physiology and pharmacy from Wake Forest University School of Medicine in 2003. We will begin with Dr. Prelo. Good morning, Judge Pryor and members of the Sentencing Commission. As already mentioned, I am a pharmacologist at the Drug Enforcement Administration. At the DEA, I routinely evaluate drugs for potential control under the Controlled Substances Act. I also testify across the country at hearings on the pharmacological effects of synthetic cathinones. Thank you for the opportunity to briefly discuss the pharmacology of synthetic cathinones. It is important to acknowledge that the pharmacological and toxic effects of cathinones have not been thoroughly investigated. There are little or no controlled human studies investigating the pharmacological effects of synthetic cathinones. However, publications regarding the pharmacological effect of synthetic cathinones obtained from animal studies have recently increased. DEA has also obtained animal pharmacology data on some cathinones through interagency agreements with other federal agencies and through research contracts. These data show that synthetic cathinones, similar to, similar to stimulant drugs of abuse, namely cocaine and methamphetamines such as methamphetamine and MDMA, primarily affect monoaminergic systems. The data attained by DEA on 19 synthetic cathinones show that these cathinones mimic the behavioral effects of both methamphetamine and cocaine. Although the pharmacology, toxicology, abuse potential, and dependence liability of most of the synthetic cathinones have not been extensively studied, the existing pharmacological data show that all synthetic cathinones that have been tested so far possess stimulant-like behavioral effects. Limited studies have compared the effects of synthetic cathinones to MDMA. To my knowledge, two synthetic cathinones, um, namely ethylone and methylone, have been studied and both fully mimic the behavioral effects of MDMA in rats. Another study in humans showed that the subjective effects of methadrone are substantially similar to MDMA. Accordingly, Synthetic cathinones are promoted by drug traffickers as replacements for psychomotor stimulants or hallucinogens such as cocaine, methamphetamine, MDMA, and methcathinone. For example, a user of synthetic cathinones testified in a court hearing that these drugs had been substituted for other drugs of abuse, including methamphetamine. Surveys of drug user populations indicate that synthetic cathinones, like MDMA and cocaine, are mainly used and abused by youths and young adults in the settings of nightclubs and dance parties, and the users are likely to be young males. Clinical case reports also confirm the findings from animal studies that cathinones produce effects similar to those of stimulants such as cocaine, methamphetamine, and MDMA. For example, Desired effects reported by users of synthetic cathinones include euphoria, sense of well-being, increased sociability, energy, empathy, increased alertness, and improved concentration and focus. 
Synthetic cathinones have been reported to produce a number of stimulant-like adverse effects, such as palpitations, seizures, vomiting, sweating, headache, hypertension, tachycardia, and even death. Other adverse effects reported include hallucinations, psychosis, paranoia, and delusions. Bizarre behaviors such as self-mutilation and episodes of delirium with persecution have also been associated with cathinone abuse. Chronic use of synthetic cathinones has been shown to cause substance use disorder. A measure of drug activity that is important in pharmacology is potency. Potency is the concentration or amount of a drug that is required to produce a given or desired effect. For example, users can simply adjust the dose of a given drug to achieve the desired effects. Therefore, it is not advisable to use the pharmacological potency of the drug as the sole factor in determining the marijuana equivalency. Other factors such as history, patterns, scope and significance of abuse, and adverse impact on the public health and social fabric also need to be considered. In summary, available data indicate that synthetic cathinones possess stimulant-like pharmacological effect. Thus, one may classify these substances under one broad pharmacological category. The abuse of synthetic cathinones, similar to stimulant drugs of abuse, can lead to serious adverse health problems, including death. Thank you for this opportunity to briefly discuss the pharmacology of synthetic cathinones. I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gatch. Prior members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the pharmacology of synthetic cathinones. My lab's been testing these synthetic cathinones pretty much since they were first observed in like 2009. Um, the purpose of this statement then is to address the pharmacological basis for considering cathinones to be a single class of compounds with similar abuse liability and harm potential. So I will do this by addressing the criterion that we use to um, determine the use liability in terms of chemical structure, pharmacological mechanism, subjective effects, rewarding or reinforcing effects, and finally likelihood of adverse effects. Uh, the definition of cathinone compounds is based on a common structure, which is quite similar to psychostimulants in general, which are in turn quite similar to the structure of dopamine, which of course is a neurotransmitter well known to be very important in learning, memory, and reward. The cathinones are easily distinguished from the amphetamine class of um, psychostimulants merely by having an oxygen attached by a double bond in a particular place in the uh, um, carbon atoms in the structure. Hence, cathinone looks pretty much just like amphetamine with this oxygen attached. Methcathinone looks just like methamphetamine with the oxygen, and methylene is just like MDMA with the additional oxygen. Not surprisingly, the cathinone compounds act very similarly to these amphetamine compounds that they resemble. So methamphetamine is very similar to methcathinone, and whereas methylone is very similar to MDMA. In terms of mechanism, all drugs of abuse increase dopamine levels in the reward centers of the brain. Psychostimulants, which directly produce strong dopamine receptor effects, like methamphetamine, are highly likely to engender compulsive seeking and addiction. Now, compounds like MDMA that increase both dopamine and serotonin are widely taken recreationally, but seldom pr progress to addiction. And so the theory now is because of that serotonin effect. And to summarize, the cathinones all act to increase levels of dopamine. Some of the cathinones also increase serotonin levels. People are able to give consistent and reliable descriptions of the drugs they experience, which then provides this basis for the subjective effects we talk about. Now, it's not possible to ask non-human animals about their drug experience, but we can train them to distinguish between the presence or absence of a drug, or even between two different drugs. This drug discrimination test provides a highly reliable animal model of the subjective effects of different drugs. Thus far, all the cathinones we've tested in the drug discrimination test in our lab and actually other labs across the country produce subjective effects either fully like cocaine or fully like methamphetamine. The few that have not generally run between 50 to 60 percent um, drug-like. Um, a few cathinones, about seven or eight now, have been also tested for MDMA-like effects, and most but not all produce these MDMA-like effects. 
In terms of rewarding effects, all the cathinones tested so far produce reward and or reinforcing effects and are likely to be used recreationally by humans. A few cathinones have been tested for reward strength in a particular kind of self-administration assay. Most of these produce levels of responding similar to cocaine and methamphetamine. Um, a couple produce levels that are remarkably high, and at least one produces much lower levels similar to those of MDMA. Now, it is possible there are some cathinones which will be MDMA-like rather than psychostimulant-like, likely those with serotonin effects as well as the dopamine effects. In terms of potency, the potencies of the cathinones tested so far pretty much fall in between those of cocaine and that of methamphetamine. So a single standard based on the potency would likely accurately describe most of the compounds. Now, there have been a few compounds that are even less potent than cocaine or methamphetamine producing subjective effects. However, these compounds produce either reward-like effects or adverse effects with similar potency in the same dose range of that of cocaine and methamphetamine. The degree to which a compound is likely to produce harm is also an important issue. Some of the cathinone compounds produce extremely high blood pressure, convulsions, confusion, psychotic-like and aggressive behaviors. Others produce long-term harm, that is serious damage to brain, heart, kidney, liver, even after just a couple doses. Even those compounds that may be less rewarding still produce toxic effects. So to summarize, the cathinones have a, have a common and easily identifiable structural identity. The compounds all produce subjective effects similar to those of either methamphetamine or of cocaine and a few like MDMA. The, the cathinones have a range of rewarding effects from those that drive highly compulsive drug seeking to those that may have only mildly rewarding effects. The potency of these compounds tends to be similar, lying between the, pot the potencies of cocaine and of methamphetamine. And all the cathinones tested so far produce some sort of harm, either high risk for addiction, short term toxic effects or long-term damage to the heart, brain, liver, or kidney. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Worst. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Real quick question. If that turns red, do I get zapped? No? Okay. Um, my job is to teach. We have security that will just remove you. Okay. <laughs> as long as I get to talk first, that's fine. Um, my job is to teach. Before I got to teach students, um, which has only been a little over a year now, I had to testify. In six years, I tested over 4,300 chemistry cases for the state of Ohio. Um, testified 31 times for those. And at that point, my job was to teach the jury. These are what the drugs are. Um, issues that we had was that we had never seen these drugs before. So they come in off the street. They're a white powder. You do your presumptive testing. You go based off of that. And then you get a mass spec, and it's something you've never seen before. Um, so that took some time. We had to figure out based on the mass spec what the structure was and then classify them. All of that led to the creation of what uh, I provided you and I call the Pharmacophore Rule. Um, one of my pharmacy professors that I worked with uh, had the idea, can we make a large class of cathinones? Because the core structure of this compound should bind to the receptors, should have an effect. All cathinones share that common core. So we went to the State Board of Pharmacy, who has emergency scheduling rights in the state of Ohio, um, wrote up what we're calling the Pharma 4 rule, presented it to them, and it's now out there. Now, uh, some of my lawyer friends say it's not been tested because everybody keeps pleading. Uh, it's not actually gone to a court of law. It's not actually gone through an appeals process. Um, from my point of view, if it doesn't make it to the court of law, it's still a win, right? right. Because they're off the street. Um, so the issue that my colleagues are addressing, structurally, I think we can make a cathinone class. Pharmacologically and behaviorally, it gets a little dicey at that point because these effects are different. Um, uh, Dr. Sprague, who I actually work with now, again, 25 years later and both a little bit more gray, um, is currently doing animal studies with meth alone because it's just like MDMA. He studied MDMA for 25 years, and it causes you to essentially boil from the inside out. Meth alone does the same thing. So these drugs are very similar to MDMA. They have stimulant properties 
that are somewhere between cocaine and methamphetamine, um, I guess ideally they would have some sort of comparison to one of those three drugs. Um, I just kind of feel bad for the committee because you have to decide where. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, questions? Well, I have some questions, maybe of, of Dr. Wurst. I mean, our, our job is to try to figure out, as you point out, where it fits in this panoply of, uh, of harms. And okay, I, I thought your article was very interesting because uh, uh, it suggests to me that uh, we're almost on a fool's errand because you can start and then there could be this tweak, this could be uh, changed slightly, uh, uh, who knows what the discernible effects are, it may be highly individualized, and suddenly we're, we're, we're assigning penalties to very different things in which maybe the penalty is the same. I don't know where we go from here. Uh, I think we're trying to figure out some rules that we can that, that we can put into place that won't that won't depend necessarily on some chemist out there uh, figuring out how to tweak it and therefore escape the impact of the rule. I don't know whether you're the panel who's going to talk about behavioral uh, 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 you know behavioral aspects of it. You've identified some of them, but let's take your rule in Ohio because it has the beauty of being relatively simple, relatively direct. Uh, are you of the opinion that when you've uh, you know, uh, employed this rule, that it is adequate uh, to take care of the tweaks, to take care of the changes, and also to take care of uh, the differences in harm that's caused by the differences in the, in, in the drug? Do you feel that that's been your experience, or has it not been your experience? I guess the issue there is my goal is to get it off the street and to make it illegal so that it was no longer sold. That I think we've accomplished. I don't know that I can address the differences in tweaks having different effects. Um, that's, that's the tricky part. I think it's, it's enough to say that it is a cathinone and we know that cathinones, no matter at what level, are harmful, at least to the level of cocaine, if not greater. Um, Unfortunately, at least, I would say at least, yes. Um, cathinone itself is kind of an outlier. Um, it's, I think its effects are closer to amphetamine itself. But the cop plant, which is we see that in Ohio a lot too, um, has not been an issue because it's all the synthetic stuff. And quite honestly, most of the drug dealers, most of the people that we see on the streets in Ohio, they want the stuff that's going to have an effect. And cathinone itself is more of a stimulant effect. As soon as you add that one methyl group and make it methcathinone, now it's got the bigger effect. So we haven't seen the cot plant, I think, in probably four or five years at least. And that's where you get the cathinone from. It's all been the synthetic stuff because that's where they're moving. Can I ask, um, if we were to take a class-based approach, this is really for all of you, um, to the extent you have testified, there are some of these differences among the different kinds, even though they share a chemical structure, that they have some different effects. I think, Dr. Gatch, you say in your testimony, if we use the same standard, but we base it on potency, that that might be the way to kind of differentiate the different kinds of effects that they're having on people. But I sort of heard your testimony, Dr. Prelo, saying potency isn't the only answer. So, so I guess I'd kind of just like to get your reactions about a class-based approach, but that then within it would distinguish on the basis of potency. Because if we're trying to just make the most easily administrable rule that also gets at the proportionality of harms, is that a pretty good fit, or are there reasons we should be cautious about that? If you can do it. <laughs> if you can. The, the, the problem is, okay. like she had mentioned, the lack of research. So we've seen more drugs on the street than have actually been researched and, and we know the effects of. So well, even if we had in a particular case, you get the drug, we know it's a cathinone because you do your chemical structure thing and it's got that core. Can it be tested for potency once you bring it in to kind of get a sense of how potent it is or no? Is that just like not administrable? Oh, that's what I do. So we, we test in those various behavioral assays and 
my behavioral estate is a much more substance abuse and liability oriented, so we don't do a lot of the um, um, other sort of medicinal kind of things. We're just looking at uh, its substance use liability, so in terms of its subjective effects and in terms of its re reinforcing effects. And as I mentioned, so far they've pretty much fallen within that range between cocaine and methamphetamine. And in the small number of cases in which, like, one of the compounds might have a subjective effect that's slightly outside of that range. Its reinforcing effects or its toxic effects will be within that range. So, in some, same as, so over, in its overall harm, I think we could probably it will fall in that range in a general way. So, if I could, so if there's a baseline, it's between methamphetamine and cocaine. The effects may pull it above or pull it below, based on potency and some yeah. other factors. Yeah. Yeah, but just one of the effects in overall. Yeah. If you look, if How you look difficult would it effects. be in terms of testimony before a court to come in and distinguish the effects? We, if we have a baseline, if we, if we set a baseline between methamphetamine and cocaine, we have it somewhere in the middle. How difficult is it for us to distinguish then higher and lower from that baseline within, within a range? I think it would be more just falling within that baseline overall. You know, I don't really know how to answer that because it hasn't been tested. I do know that uh, um, Department of Justice lawyers have, have been using the potency data because so far they've been just doing drug by drug, you know, comparing its potency with the marijuana equivalent apparently. And apparently, I've, I've been told this last meeting, and um, drug administration meeting last June, that so far it's held up in court every time that drug, that drug discrimination data we've used. So it seems to be robust at least at this point. Is potency a good a good indication, in your view? Is potency a good indication of harm? Uh, the more potent, the the greater the harm. The toxicity is in the dose, and a lot of the users can simply just take the dose um, and get the harm. So the doses are not so great that they can't compensate by taking more of the drug. So I don't think that potency should be such a big factor because you can still get harm just by taking more. What about potency plus quantity, like doses? But the doses that you need to take for the harm are not so, they're in the milligram quantities. And so you can still take enough to achieve that harm. And everybody's different, too, in terms of yeah. tolerances and everything else. Yeah. And so what one dose is for one person is half a dose for somebody else. Yeah. And to the extent that, that, that we try to make these distinctions based on potency, dosage, toxicity, we're then leading ourselves back into the problem that we're here to try to deal with, right? right. Which is battles of experts in sentencing hearings, right? right? Yep. Lowest common, lowest common denominator. You you pick the the level that you feel is appropriate, but is not going above. I mean, until you have more research and you can say what the effects of all these different drugs are. You can't really uh, appropriately place them, I think. But your view is that, that as a baseline, it's at least as dangerous as cocaine. As cocaine. Is that? I would, I would say that yes. Do, do, do yeah. you both agree with that? Yes. Yes, I agree. Okay. That's helpful. That's very helpful. We'll move on to our next panel. Thank you very much um, for your help today. Thank and, you. And for your written testimony as well. Yeah.